Hi everyone, this is Pastor Apostolos. It's so great that we can worship God uh, with one another in each other's homes today. Today we're going to continue our series on the book of Romans. So if you have your Bibles, please take it out and turn to Romans chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. If you don't have your Bibles, um, I'll give you a few moments to get it. So please turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 3, verses 1 to to eight, and I'll be reading from the NIV version. How about you read along with me as I read it? Romans 3 verses 1 to 8. What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar. As it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I am using a human argument. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases His glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil, that good may result? Their condemnation is just. Well, I received some bad news recently through my letterbox. I, I got a speeding ticket. Apparently, a few weeks ago, I was driving over 50 kilometers per hour in a 40 kilometer school zone. So I've copped a $360 fine and four demerit points. If that was not bad enough, in the next letter, I got another fine. It turns out I was not only speeding, but I was driving an unregistered car. That's another $686 fine on top, making it over $1,000 in total. As you can imagine, I was not very happy about it. So unfair. Let's start with the speeding ticket first. I honestly uh, did not see any school zone signs in that area. And even if there was one, they should have made it more obvious, like have it right in front of me, or even better, have a siren going off to wake up uh, sleepy drivers uh, who are not paying attention, which was probably me that day. And with regards to the car registration, I honestly had no, my, I had no idea that my car was unregistered. I didn't receive any reminder notice that my uh, car registration is about to expire. Only later, when I rummaged through the messy pile of documents on my desk, did I realize that I indeed did receive a renewal uh, notice a few months ago, but I mistakenly filed it away thinking it was a car registration certificate. Because I don't know if you can see from over there, look, the thing that stands out the most when you read this letter is. The heading, Certificate of Registration. And they make it look like it is a certificate. You know, who's going to take notice of that a little writing at the corner telling you how much is owing and the due date? Um, yes, I admit I was uh, a bit careless. And now you all probably think I'm a bit of a dummy for not being able to tell the difference between an invoice and a car registration certificate. But still, uh, surely Service New South Wales uh, bears some of the responsibility. You know, they should have done a better job at reminding me that my car registration is about to expire. And even if I have committed an offence, over $1,000, that's a bit too much, don't you think? Surely the state government is profiteering from all of this. So what did I do? I did what any other person would do. I appealed the decision. 
I wrote back to the state uh, uh, Office of State Revenue arguing why I thought I deserved leniency due to my special circumstances. And I think I made a pretty strong case, actually. Well, last week I uh, received um, uh, the outcome of my appeal. Would you like to know what the outcome was? I'll tell you a bit later. But that is what we all do when we come across unfairness, isn't it? We appeal. We protest. We come up with all sorts of objections. Look at how well this Black Lives Matter movement has caught on all around the world. Why have thousands of people defied health warnings to gather in these mass protests? To voice out their objections to racial unfairness. Well, you know, that is how many people treat God's word as well. They find what the Bible says unfair or unreasonable. And so they come up with all sorts of objections. When I did a Google search, here are some of the most common objections that people have against Christianity. How can you know God exists? How can you believe in a good God when there is so much evil and suffering in this world? How can a loving God send people to hell? How can the Bible be accurate and true when it was written by people over hundreds of years and seems to uh, uh, contain um, all sorts of errors and contradictions? Such objections to the gospel are not just a 21st century thing. They were around during the first century as well. And in today's passage, we see the Apostle Paul uh, deal with some of the objections against uh, the gospel that were around during his day. In chapters 1 to 2, Paul has been arguing that all people are under God's judgment because of their wickedness. Romans chapter 1 verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. In chapter 1, Paul condemns the pagans, those who do not believe in God and do not live by his laws. You can imagine the Jews would have been very pleased with what Paul says in chapter 1 because in Judaism, anyone who is non-Jewish and is not circumcised are deemed to be unclean and therefore um, under God's wrath. But in chapter 2, Paul turns his attention to the Jews, to those who do believe in God and live by his laws. And he says, you too are without excuse, because you who pass judgment on others do the very same things. Paul says to the Jews, you also will be judged by God because you too have failed to keep God's laws and commandments. Now, as you can imagine, the Jews would not have been very happy with what Paul says in chapter 2 because Judaism was built upon God's covenant with Abraham. The Jews saw themselves as God's chosen people. So how can Paul possibly you know, put them on equal footing as everyone else. You can understand why a Jewish reader would have all sorts of objections to Paul's teachings at this point. This is something all pastors and Bible teachers have to be prepared for. If you teach the Bible, you are bound to come across people who misunderstand you or take your words out of context. Every Bible faith, uh, teacher faces the risk of having people draw false conclusions from what uh, you are saying or putting things in your mouth that you never said. If you say A and B, they will falsely assume that you mean C and D. So in Romans chapter 3, verse 1 to 8, Paul deals with some of these misunderstandings and objections. In these verses, Paul uses what is known as a diatribe. A diatribe was a popular teaching method that was uh, used by ancient Greek philosophers 
whereby uh, you set up an imaginary dialogue with an opponent. Here, Paul's imaginary opponent is a Jew, who peppers Paul with uh, a series of questions. We can't say for sure whether these, uh, these are actual objections that Paul faced during his ministry, or whether they are just hypothetical objection that Paul anticipates from his readers. Regardless, Paul's main purpose here is to clarify any misunderstandings or objections that people may have against his teachings. The objections are found in the odd-numbered verses, in verses 1, 3, 5, and 7. And Paul's reply to these objections are found in the even-numbered verses, in verses 2, 4, 6, and 8. So we basically have a, a Q&A session here. Four objections and four rebuttals. The first objection is in verse 1. What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? The argument Paul's opponent is making here is that if Paul's teaching is true, that the Jews are also under God's judgment, then wouldn't that mean that God's covenant with Israel has no value at all? Circumcision, the law, all these God gave to Abraham's descendants to signify uh, they are his chosen people. But Paul, you now seem to be saying that all these covenantal privileges mean nothing and that there is no advantage in being a Jew. Doesn't that undermine God's covenant with Israel? So how does Paul reply to this objection? He says in verse 2, much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. In other words, while it is true that being a Jew gives you no advantage when it comes to God's judgment, that is not to say that there is no uh, value in being a Jew. The biggest advantage that a Jew has is that they have the very words of God written down for them in the Old Testament. They have a knowledge of the mind, will, and character of God that no other people possess. But they failed to make good use of this advantage. If all of humanity is you know, stumbling in the darkness, the Jews, at least, had a great big flashlight to you know, to show people the way. But they failed to put this flashlight into good use. So it is not that God's covenant is worthless. Rather, it is the Jews who have failed to take advantage of their covenantal privileges. They were no better off than those who did not have the law because they were not putting the law into practice as God intended. Now, this may not mean much to us because most of us are not Jews, but what are some of the ways that we take God's privileges for granted? For many years, I felt that my Christian testimony lacked substance because I was born into a Christian family and I have gone to church all my life. As ashamed as I am to say this, you know, I even envy those who are far away from God because at least they get to have a dramatic conversion experience. But as I got older, I came to realize what a tremendous privilege it is to be raised up by Christian parents who take you to church every Sunday because I had the opportunity to know God from a very young age. But Many Christians today take that for granted. So many people today, for example, have you know, multiple Bibles sitting um, in their homes. But these Bibles are just gathering dust on their bookshelves. You may remember uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, President uh, Trump got a lot of negative publicity for clearing away 
protesters just to stage a photo op in front of a church holding a Bible in one hand. A, rep a reporter uh, then asked President Trump, is that your Bible, President? To which President Trump replied, it's a Bible. In other words, he wasn't reading it. But there's a great difference between having a Bible and reading the Bible, isn't there? You know, just, you know, uh, the Bible by itself is of no value if you do not read it or put it into practice. Here in Australia, we are so privileged. We are so blessed. We have such easy access to the Bible. You can buy it from any bookstore. But that is not the case in other parts of the world. In countries such as Iran, North Korea or Afghanistan, people are executed on the spot if they are caught um, with a Bible. Millions of our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world are desperate for a copy of the Bible, but are unable to get their hands on one. Whereas here in Australia and in the West, we have an oversupply of Bibles. But only a minority are actually reading the Bible seriously. Like the Jews, we have been entrusted with the very words of God. But we are not making good use of our advantage. So yes, being born into a Christian family, going to church and having the Bible, all these are not going to save you. But that does not mean these things are useless. They have great value, so long as you use them in the right way. So the first objection that Paul dismisses is the criticism that his teaching undermines God's covenant. The second objection is in verse 3. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? In other words, if some Jews miss out on God's kingdom because they fail to measure up, what about God's promises to Israel? Wouldn't that mean that God has been unfaithful in keeping his promises? Well, Paul replies in verse 4, not at all. The original word here is meganeto, the strongest no possible in the Greek language. Not on your life or not in a thousand years is what we would probably say today. The point Paul is making here is that God is always true to his word. Because faithfulness is a core part of his unchanging character. As Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says, God never lies. Humans, on the other hand, we lie all the time, don't we? Which of us can say that we have never lied before? If you say yes uh, to that question, I would say that you are lying right now. People's words are unreliable, but God's word is steadfast. In today's society, what people consider to be truth is often what the majority say. For example, a lot of pe people believe the Bible cannot be true because the scientists and academics tell them that it is impossible for miracles to happen or for someone to be raised from the dead. But just because yes, they have never seen it happen before doesn't mean that it can't happen. If God is God, then he can do anything. Real truth is not based on what people say or what the majority says. Truth is based on what God says, because only God's word is true. Even if the whole world were to speak with one voice and God was to say the opposite, God would be true and the whole world would be liars. So it doesn't matter what people say or what the textbooks say or what the news reporters say. The only thing that matters is what God says in his word, because only God's word is true. 
Paul goes on to say, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. Here, Paul quotes from Psalm chapter 51, verse 4, a psalm written by King David when he was caught having adultery with Bathsheba. In this psalm, Paul, uh, uh, David acknowledges that God was right to judge him. You see, on the final day of judgment, it is not what we say or what people say or what the world says that will prevail. It will be what God says that prevails. God's word will be proven right and everyone will be judged according to his word. So yes, listen to the experts, read lots of books, do your research and think critically, but always remember where the ultimate source of truth lies. Not in man's word, but in God's word. God is always true to his word. He is always faithful. Just because not all Jews will get to enter heaven doesn't mean that God has failed to keep his promises to them. After all, God's covenant with Abraham never guaranteed that all Jews would uh, automatically get to enter God's kingdom. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, you will see that the old covenant came with both blessings and curses. Blessings for those who obey God and curses for those who disobey Him. The old covenant was not unilateral, but bilateral. It was not unconditional, but conditional upon Israel's obedience. So God has always been faithful in keeping His end of the covenant. It's the Jews, not God, who have been unfaithful in keeping their end of the covenant. You see, it's human nature to blame God for our, everything that go, for whatever goes wrong in our lives. But in verse 4, Paul reminds the Jews that God is always right and true in everything he does. So the gospel in no way undermines God's faithfulness, as what Paul's critics were falsely accusing him of saying. The third objection is found in verse 5. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? Paul's main theme throughout the book of Romans is that no one can be made righteous through the law. Because none of us can keep it perfectly. So God has made another way for us to uh, get right with him. One that is not based on our own works, but on what Jesus Christ has done for us at the cross. But this can lead some people to draw the false conclusion that we actually do God a favor by sinning. Because our unrighteousness gives God the opportunity to display his love and mercy. So why should we be condemned? for our sins when our unrighteousness actually results in more praise to God's name. Of course, this is just human logic speaking here, not divine logic, which Paul is quick to make a note of. One common version of this objection today is the argument, if God knew already when he made humans that uh, they would sin, and he had already planned for Jesus to come into our world to save us. Isn't it unfair for God to send people to hell when it was his plan to begin with all along? Doesn't that make God someone responsible for human sin? To this, Paul emphatically replies in verse 6, Certainly not. Here is that. Meganeto word again. Nonsense, Paul basically says. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Here, Paul refutes his opponent's questioning with a counter question. He points out the absurdity that line of argument would lead to. It will mean that God would never be able to judge anyone then. 
which would inevitably lead to lawlessness and moral anarchy. It would just be like saying that the policeman responsible for killing George Floyd should not be prosecuted because something good came out of it. It shone a spotlight into how widespread uh, 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 racism is in the police force and sparked a worldwide push for social reform. But should the positive after effects of their wrongdoing absolve these policemen of guilt? No way, right? In the same way, just because our unrighteousness brings out the righteousness of God, that doesn't mean it is unfair for God to judge us. To not judge the wicked, that will be what is really unfair. So, the third objection that Paul refutes is the argument that the gospel undermines God's fairness. The fourth objection builds upon the third objection. Verses 7 to 8. Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases His glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result? Here, Paul is not answering an imaginary objection. He is answering an actual criticism that many of his opponents were making against him in his day. You know, these critics accused Paul of promoting sin because they drew the false conclusion that uh, if salvation is not something that uh, you earn by your works, but rather something that you simply receive um, by God's grace as a gift when you believe in Jesus, then people can just keep on sinning. And if our sinfulness enhances God's glory in the same way a you know, diamond sparkles brighter um, against a dark backdrop, then why should we, we, we be punished for our sins when we make God look good? This is a common misunderstanding of the gospel today as well. A lot of people today reject the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith alone because they think it takes away the motivation for people to live righteously. I was uh, sharing the gospel with a, a Muslim recently. Um, where, uh, and, we got, and as we got talking, I, I uh, ex explained to him um, the difference between his religion as, and mine. I told him that uh, in Islam, um, you know, you have to do good works in order to be saved. But in Christianity, it's the uh, other way around. You know, we do, do good works because we have already been saved through what Jesus has done for us. And this Muslim just scoffed at me and said, that's the problem he has with Christianity. It gives people a license to sin. Now, it is true that some Christians have given Christianity a bad name by thinking and behaving in such a way. Um, I know of a Christian, for example, who divorced his wife. And um, when his wife begged him not to because such a thing displeases God, uh, he replied, I don't care because... I have already believed in Jesus and therefore I'm saved. This Christian uh, was clearly taking God's grace for gr granted. And you have to doubt whether he is really a Christian or not. Those who think and behave in such a way uh, show that they, are not, that they not only misunderstand the gospel, but they are abusing God's grace. And do you think God will forgive those who abuse His grace? In verse 8, Paul doesn't even bother to spend time responding to such objectors. He simply says that condemnation is just. The argument is so ridiculous and so perverse in nature that Paul sees no need to refute them at all. It is self-evident that people who say such a thing, deserve God's punishment. Those who argue that the gospel encourages sin are obviously just looking 
for a loophole so that they can keep sinning. W.C. Fields was an American comedian and actor who was well known for his hard drinking and contempt for people. And he remained a staunch atheist throughout his life. Just before his death, however, a friend visiting him in the hospital uh, caught him flipping through uh, a Bible. Uh, surprised, this friend asked Fields what he was doing with a Bible. And Fields replied, I'm looking for loopholes. That is what many people are doing today. They are looking for loopholes. But there are no loopholes in the Bible. Either you believe in Jesus so that you can be saved, or you spend an eternity in hell. It's as simple as that. I opened today's sermon by mentioning that I had tried to appeal my driving fine. Guess how Service New South Wales um, responded to my appeal. We acknowledge your comments indicating the circumstances which contributed to this offence. However, we are unable to cancel the penalty. As a driver, it is your responsibility to check road signs and ensure the vehicle you are driving is unregistered, uh, is registered. And what can I say? At the end of the day, they are right. I am guilty. It doesn't matter how good my excuse was or what my circumstances were. The undeniable fact is that I committed an offence and therefore I am guilty. Well, in the same way, you can make all the excuses you want, but it won't change the fact that you and I are guilty of breaking God's laws and commandments. All of us, at some time or another, recognize that we are moral failures. All of us have hurt others with our words and actions. All of us have acted selfishly and not loved others as ourselves. All of us have lied and cheated here and there. All of us have fail to live up to God's holy standards and therefore we are guilty and God is right to judge us. Are you going to appeal God's justice or are you going to submit to it and ask God for forgiveness? If you keep refusing to confess your sins and repent from your rebellion against God, it's only going to lead you to an eternity in hell. But if you confess your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ, 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 promises us, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So what excuses have you been making? What objections do you have against the gospel? Do you doubt God's existence? Do you find it hard to reconcile how a loving God can you know, send people to hell? Or how a good God can allow evil and suffering to occur in this world? Perhaps you doubt the reliability and truth of the Bible. Whatever your objections are to the gospel, May I encourage you today to set aside your prejudices and pride. Don't listen to what other people say. Come to the Bible with a spirit of humility and an open heart to listen to what God has to say. I'm confident that if you let God speak to you, you He will give you a good answer to all your objections. If you do have some questions or objections uh, uh, about Christianity, I would love 
to hear from you. You can find my uh, contact details uh, in the description section under this video. Please send me a message. Or you can post your questions or uh, uh, in the comments section under this video. I promise you, I will respond to your queries. And if you are already a Christian, may I encourage you to engage and interact more with non-Christians. Anticipate their objections and equip yourself to know how to answer them. Because if you share the gospel with others, you are bound to come across people with all sorts of questions and objections to the gospel. Would you know how to answer them? If you don't, it's just going to consolidate their view that the Christian faith has loopholes. But the Bible has no loopholes. It's just that Christians do not know their Bibles well enough and they have not spent enough time and effort to uh, equip themselves on how to defend their faith. So my dear brothers and sisters, start reading your Bibles more. Do your research about what potential questions and objections non-believers may ask you. Equip yourself with the Word of God so that when uh, people come against you with uh, their questions and objections about uh, Christianity, you will know how to answer them. Because God is just and His Word is always true. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that in this dark and lost world full of fake news, misinformation, uh, mistruths, we th that we can have access to real truth in your word. For it is only your word that is absolutely true. It is your word that is steadfast and faithful. It is your word that is a light unto our path in this dark world that we are living in. We thank you for the great privilege it is to live in a country like Australia, where we have such easy access to your word. Whereas in other countries around the world, our brothers and sisters do not have that privilege. So help us, O oh Lord God, to not waste this great privilege that we have. Help us to not have our Bibles collecting dust on our bookshelves. Help us to read it and to feed upon it regularly so that we may come to know you better and know how to live as you want us to live in this world. Forgive us, O oh Lord God, um, for we are prone to come up with excuses and objections when we read things in the Bible that we don't like. In those moments, help us, Lord God, to take your word as it is and to uh, trust that your word is true. We pray for all those who have not yet believed in you, all those who may have all sorts of uh, objections um, about the Christian faith. We pray, O oh Lord God, that you will open their eyes and open their minds and open their hearts to see the truth that is in your word so that they may believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. Help us, Lord God, to not just share your word, but also to defend the faith that we have. Equip us, O oh Lord God, to be able to uh, answer uh, all the uh, objections and questions that non-believers may come against us so that uh, we may uh, lead them to know you. So help us, Lord God, to, uh, to 
read your word, to understand it, and to believe it. And we pray all this in Jesus' name.